Hi. So far, we have been working with the assumption that we're always working with just one language. For example, we have calculated our probabilities for English text. We have calculated probabilities for um, generating sentences in Spanish and so forth. However, most of the world uses more than one language in their daily life. Here we'll look at a few examples of multilingualism, uh, at a specific example called diglossia, and what the consequences of this multilingualism might be for our natural language processing products. Let's begin by normalizing this idea that you can have more than two languages in your life. Um, language duality is not a problem, but an innate ability. It is an accurate reflection of a duality that exists in all of us, a duality between our mundane life and our spiritual one. From Nagib Mahfus. So first, I want to begin by asking you, um, how many languages do you use in your daily life? If you use more than one, when do you speak one language and when do you use the other? Do you sometimes mix them? So maybe start a sentence in a language and end it in a different one. What do you think of people who do that? And even if you only speak one language yourself, have you ever been in a place where they speak more than one? Um, did you notice that some languages were used for some things and some languages were used for other things? So indeed, most people in the world uh, have more than one language in their lives. And sometimes one language is used for, for some uh, people and tasks, and there's other languages when you do something else. And there's many combinations in which this can happen. Uh, multilingualism is one. We're also going to be looking at code switching, Creole languages, and diglossia. So the most basic combination is multilingualism, where there's two languages, and sometimes you're speaking English, and sometimes you're speaking something else, for example. In Switzerland, there are four official languages. There's um, German, Italian, French, and Romance, which is another Romance language. And in theory, you could be able to conduct your entire life in Romance if you want, and then the government uh, needs to provide schools that can educate you in that language. The government has to be able to function in that language as well, and to function in all languages equally. In New Zealand, for example, there's two official languages, English and the indigenous language Maori. And in theory, there's a lot of provisions for them to have equal footing in society so that you could uh, go to school in Maori or in English, uh, all law needs to be translated into both languages, needs to be issued in both languages. This also happens in Belgium, where people speak either French or Flemish, which is a variant of Dutch. In practice, of course, um, these lofty ideals where all the languages are equal are very difficult to maintain. In New Zealand, for example, Maori is, is legally on equal footing, but in practice, there's always struggles making sure that it, there's enough funds to run Maori language schools, to, um, to be sh uh, sure that signs in uh, the public space are in both languages and so forth. So uh, multilingualism refers to having more than one language in society. Doesn't mean that they're all treated equally, unfortunately, but in decent theory, it means that you can conduct your language in one or in the other. There's something called code switching, where you might have more than one language, but then they mix together in your daily life. For example, uh, in India, there's something called Hinglish, which is a combination of English and Hindi. You can sometimes have, as in number one and, num and number three, Hangrikya, which is uh, hunger and like a question mark, uh, like, are you hungry? Uh, here in the Snickers commercial, app hunger, kokaro, bye bye, grab a Snickers. This means, is hunger here now? Bye bye, grab a Snickers. Uh, you can have it like in number two, which means think differently, think hatke. So, as you can see, um, you can begin with one language and end in a different one, so that you're going in and out between the two. 
And this is not at all a chaotic or random process. It's the complete opposite. It can it is a very precise switching between them. And as a matter of fact, it mostly happens at the edge of grammatical phrases. So places where you would like breathe to continue. Um, if you took intro to linguistics, this is the constituents. So code switching happens at the edge of constituents. For example, in um, Spanglish from New York, as little Red Riding Hood is walking along the forest, se encuentra con un lobo. She runs into a wolf. As you can see, along the forest, se encuentra con un lobo. Uh, there's very precise places where you can do the switch between them. You can also have code switching between two dialects of the same language. For example, standard American English and African American vernacular English. As you can see here, it happens at the same points where you would take a breath to uh, keep going. So at about uh, two o'clock, they wasn't back. You can see here that some parts of the speech of this one person are in sta um, standard American English. You know one o'clock they weren't back. Those are marked in red. And some parts are in African American vernacular English. Two o'clock they wasn't back. They're in blue. And uh, this one goes back and forth between standard American English and African American vernacular English. And they have, uh, you, can, you can see it because they have different um, grammatical markers. For example, the words was and were in standard American English have only one form in African American vernacular English, was. And this is by no means a defect of the language. If anything, it is something that many other uh, languages do. Swedish verbs, for example, work exactly like this. There's only one form for the verb. There's also something called zero copula, or deleting the verb be. As in the example below, we just walking around. Um, it, standard American English would have a be there, but in African American vernacular English, the be disappears. It's deleted, but this happens in many languages. Russian, for example, also has zero copulas for its present tense. And this doesn't mean that it's defective in any way. It's They're perfectly uh, good languages working in perfectly normal ways. So as you can see, you can have two languages or two uh, variants of one language where you go back and forth between them. This is code switching. So far we have multilingualism, two languages, code switching, two languages going back and forth. There's a third situation called Creole languages. And before we talk about them, I'm going to show you an example going from um, English from England to different forms of Creole English from Jamaica. The North Wind and the Sun were disputing which was the stronger when a traveler came along wrapped in a warm cloak. The North Wind and the Sun were disputing which was the stronger when a traveler came along wrapped in a warm cloak. The North Breeze and the Sun are argue about who stronger than who when one traveler come wrap up in our sweater. The North Wind and the Sun did a course about which one of them stronger when them see one man come well wrap up in our seat and look like our winter cloak. Hmm. There we go. So as you can see, they are um, there's slight changes in between them, but if you compare the one called the Basilect to the one uh, to the English from Britain on the other side, they are quite different. These types of languages are born out of tragedy, mostly. Uh, enslaved people were usually grouped together so that they wouldn't be able to communicate and to plot to overthrow the people who had enslaved them. So they were placed in, in groups that were linguistically varied so that they couldn't communicate. This uh, gave rise to a situation where people used a mixture of the colonial language, English, Spanish, Dutch, Arabic, with uh, elements from the languages from Africa that the community had. Um, there's also Creole, uh, Creole language in Hawaii, for example. So it was English with uh, elements from Tagalog and from other languages of Asia. And so this gave a situation where you have a kind of mix between um, the colonial language and other languages. And these are not 
wrong or broken versions of English, for example. Far from it. They have a lot of complexity in them. And as you can see, they are full languages. But people usually go back and forth between the um, English language, the mesolect, I'm sorry, the acrolect, and the one that most resembles the Creole, the basilect. So they go back and forth depending on the circumstance. And of course, the circumstance is whether someone is from inside of the community or outside of the community, and what you want to talk about. Sometimes if you want to talk with your family about things from um, your home, you're going to talk in a more basilect kind of way. Sometimes if you're in university, uh, because the English language is associated with power and with education, you're going to talk in a more acrolect kind of way, in a way that most resembles the English from Britain. And of course, this has to do with imbalances in power, not because one language is better than the other. Talking about this, we have a final situation called the glossia. So, so far we have multilingualism, which is two languages, code switching, which is two languages or, or dialects of a language, where you go back and forth between them, and Creole languages, where you have um, a colonial language and a language that is a mixture of the colonial language and other languages, and you go back and forth between them. The glossia is a situation where a language has a certain function in society. So if you want to say very formal things, you use Portuguese, like in this sign from Cape Verde, where the one um, in the upper left says entrance to people um, younger than 18 year old is forbidden. So if you want to say a very formal thing, you use Portuguese. And if you want to say a fun thing, like an XL flavor, and for parties, my good friend XL, you use a Creole language. Um, this is from Cape Verde in Western Africa. And Portuguese has the function of being written and formal. And the Creole language has the function of being informal and oriented towards fun, family, and so forth. Because each language has its own function in society, there is the people essentially speak one language for some things, one language for different things. We call this diglossia. Uh, a very important example of diglossia in the world is Arabic. So Arabic uh, is made up of many different languages. There's one called Modern Standard Arabic, which uh, is the one that's used in the writing of Arabic. So if you have books in Arabic, they will be written in this language. However, when people speak to one another, they're going to use different languages called colloquials. And they're different throughout the Middle East. So for example, the colloquial Arabic of Egypt is different from the colloquial Arabic of Morocco, different from the colloquial Arabic of Yemen, and so different that people from, um, for example, Dubai are going to have a lot of trouble understanding people speaking Arabic from Morocco. They write in modern standard Arabic, but each of them speaks in Moroccan or Emirati Arabic and so forth. It's, it's an example. I always like to, um, to have the metaphor of imagine if in Romance languages, people wrote in Latin, but then they spoke to their families in Spanish and French and Italian so that all of our books were written in Latin but then our conversations were in Spanish. And so I could understand French books because they'd be in Latin, but I couldn't speak to them because I speak Spanish and not French, for example. This is what happens in the Arab world. Um, in, for example, in this sentence, um, I love reading a lot. Um, you have one form in modern standard Arabic, which is written in the characters, as you can see, and then you have spoken forms for the dialects that are very different from one another. For example, from uh, Tunisia, in Hib Nakra Barsha, but in Egyptian, Ana Bahib El Iraya Awi, but in Jordan, Ana Ktir Bahib El Kira'a. As you can see, 
these are very different from one another, uh, as different as uh, French and Spanish, for example. So uh, um, the glossia again is would be a situation where people write and say very formal things in modern standard Arabic, and where they speak about uh, things with family and friends in their colloquials. What does that have to do with us? It would be, we really have to think of what kind of input people are providing and what kind of output do we need to provide in um, societies that have the glossia, for example. These kinds of situations where you need to use more than one language. This is an example of how uh, Tunisian Arabic works. For example, in writing, you have the classical Arabic, you have modern standard Arabic, and you also have French on top of this. But when people are, um, for example, on TV with uh, watching sitcoms, when you get uh, cartoons, when you read the menus, they're written in the colloquial. So, for example, uh, elevated Tunisian Arabic, but also um, code switching between uh, local Tunisian Arabic and modern standard Arabic. So in this game, going back and forth, what kind of training set would you collect? If uh, Tunisian Arabic is not written very often, how would you gather data so that you can then calculate transition probabilities and you can calculate n-grams? If only modern standard Arabic is written, how are you going to get the data for uh, colloquial Tunisian Arabic. Will we have to go to Twitter Will we, uh, for them to write it informally? Will we have to go to chats? Uh, is there going to be no writing and then you're just going to have to do uh, to get the data from speech recognition? If there's no writing, how are you going to make the speech recognizer work? The, um, there's many challenges that uh, societies with more than one language present to us for natural language processing. And I mean, for example, what is Siri going to say in Tunisian? What, which of all of these is Siri going to choose? Siri would have to pay attention to the context to try to figure out if it's more appropriate to answer in modern standard, in um, colloquial Tunisian, and so forth. As a quick summary, most societies on Earth do use more than one language. It is a, it is a historical accident that English-speaking societies are, mo are more monolingual than other societies on the planet. Well, it has historical reasons, but that's out of the scope of the class. Um, for societies that have more than one language, there's many combinations in which it can happen. You can have multilingualism, where you have uh, languages that are well separated. You can have code switching, where you go back and forth. You can have pigeons and creoles, where you go back and forth between um, high prestige varieties and varieties that are more, more for use in the home. And you can have diglossia, where you have very clear edges of what a language, of this language does this, this language does that, and so forth. When you make NLP software, um, you might need to get multilingual training sets just for the software of that one society. You might need to make plants and how to handle multilingual input and how to uh, determine what the best output would be in each circumstance.